This week on Hangar Talk, Tom Haynes is a legend. And now you can take a likeness of Bessie Coleman with you, even on a flight. The GFC 500 from Garmin hopefully solved those runaway trim issues. And we asked the FTC to help us curb deceptive FBO pricing. Finally, hydrogen power takes off. Ian, are you ready to do some Hangar Talk? Let's do it, David. From AOPA, your freedom to fly. This is Hangar Talk. Yeah, the 1056 turn right heading 130, contact final. Welcome to Hangar Talk, everybody. I'm Ian Twombly. I'm David Tillis. David, our guest this week, Chelsea Smith. She is on Instagram. I'm going to see if I can get this right. High maintenance underscore Chels, C H E L S. She is um, a young A and P I A and an instrument rated commercial pilot. She also happens to be partners with Josh Flowers, who we've had on the show before. So we actually were able to interview them both when they came to AOPA. We run that Josh Flowers interview, and now it's time for Chelsea. Really inspiring for, I think, especially for young women to see her yeah. so successful as, as an A&P, especially. Absolutely. And I got to tell you, they were both a pleasure to meet and deal with. And, uh, you know, I, I met them on the photo side of things and they were really easy to work with. Uh, Chelsea has got some real chops, as you said. She's mm -hmm. got over 800 hours uh, in the cockpit, you know, behind the controls as well. So a lot of uh, experience there as a pilot and a lot of experience as a maintenance technician. Okay, so we'll get to her in a few minutes, starting with, though, the news. And Tom Haynes, we all knew it, David, because we worked with him. Uh, he has now been, everybody else now knows, uh, a legend. He's a living legend of aviation. He was a legend even before I got to AOPA, Ian. I couldn't believe that I was I was working with Tom. You know, he's been on Hangar Talk before. We had a nice That's true. Sal salute to Tom right before mm -hmm. he retired. But golly, and like the, this was, it was a 20th anniversary of the Aviation Legends uh, hmm. Awards out in California. And he joins a, a really a very unique roster. And there were some celebrities even uh, on the, um, the podium uh, during uh, Tom's in, uh, in indoctrination, I guess. And, you know, and uh, that included uh, our favorite Star Trek captain. William Shatner, also mm. a pilot. Mm -hmm. Yeah, right. which I didn't know. That's awesome. Right. And uh, other folks who have been honored in the past, by the way, Mark Baker, Barry Schiff, Patty Wagstaff, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. But Tom was out there and he represented AOPA Pilot Magazine. And we're very happy that everyone knows that he's a living legend. Yeah. So he did say, of course, the, the job allowed him to go all over the world, which we know, and, and he's talked about. Um, and then obviously to lead us and, and the media team over decades. And so when he stepped away, uh, there was a succession plan that allowed some younger people to come into the department. And he said he's very proud of that and should be because now our staff has, has changed actually considerably in the last couple of years. True. And, and part of that is because of retirement. So he's still staying busy, um, still flying a lot, uh, still doing a little work for AOPA now and then, uh, traveling with the family and uh, occasionally going out to California and, you know, wearing a tux and accepting awards, which is not so bad. And then, uh, you know, he posted, this is typical Tom Haynes. He posted a couple of days later, he was working on his, uh, uh on his bathroom. And so he's yeah, got his totally award right. on yeah. and he's underneath the toilet there doing some renting. So he said, you know, honored one day and plumber the next. So yeah, right. yeah. typical Tom, I mean, hats off to you, Tom Haynes. Congratulations. Yeah. Congrats. Okay. Moving on another legend, actually, um, Bessie Coleman. Oh yeah. And, um, it's coming up, David, you were rightly pointed out coming up on black history month, um, in a couple of days, Yeah, February. And, um, so it's a good excuse to talk about Bessie Coleman. And the other is that she, her likeness is going to be codified now in the Barbie collection, which is so cool. Yeah. She's got to have a quarter that, uh, that was what I was alluding to. You're, you can carry a likeness of Bessie Coleman around with you. She's going to be one of a handful of, of women that are um, that will be recognized in quarters the, the hmm. you know change that you can carry along with you and she will my daughter lauren i want to give props to daughter lauren she's our number one listener ian so hmm. we have we have that's at awesome. least well we have at least one listener oh so, that's good yeah <laughs> anyway lauren <laughs> who's uh actually um a, a sophomore in college pointed out that there is a new barbie inspired bessie coleman doll uh, Ian, you, you recognize that it costs $35. So good, mm -hmm. uh, appreciate that background. 
the doll will have a little BC uh, insignia on her hat, and she will be wearing a period costume. Mm -hmm. And now the airplane, uh, the, the Curtis JN4 Jenny will not come with this particular Barbie inspired Bessie Coleman, but we researched that and found you could buy the models at Amazon, Walmart, find them on eBay, et cetera. Yeah. But I think that's cool to have a Barbie and a quarter in your likeness. That is cool. That is cool. And Bessie Coleman, if you don't know, I would, I would, geez, I would hope most listeners know who she is, but if you don't, um, she was the first African-American and first native American pilot actually, uh, had to go to France to do that. This was in 1921, if I'm not mistaken. Uh -huh. Um, and, uh, she had to learn, this is incredible by the way. And as somebody who has learned, is learning, is trying to learn a foreign language, um, I will give her a ton of credit here because to, she learned French to be able to travel to France and learn to fly where they allowed her to do that. Learned, got an FAI license and then came back to the States, couldn't find a job flying. So, uh, did some additional training. I think a little bit of barnstorming, unfortunately was killed in an accident. She fell out, which is, oh my God. It was strange. It, it was an airplane that she had just purchased and they were doing a little maintenance to it and they were on a maintenance test flight, if I recall. Yeah. And mm -hmm. the airplane went upside down, inverted, and and she and the uh, maintenance technician the pilot uh, fell out. They yeah. both did. Awful. Yeah. yeah. Not surprising given the time period and how many that happened to. Um, that's so funny, actually, because are you ready for a total tangent? That just reminds me of Mike Bush and, and his philosophy, which is maintenance induced failures, right? That you should only do maintenance when it's required. In oh, part, he's right. He is right. Because it can you can have these maintenance induced failures. And I don't think they were thinking about falling out but, of the airplane. When but to but bring back in, it does not, happen. No, but back in 1926, we didn't have the safety harnesses that we have yeah, now. Right. And uh, the JN4, Jenny, I mean, that aircraft, I photographed a few of those. I have never mm. flown one. But it is, I mean, I'm sure it was remarkable for its time, Ian. Mm -hmm. But as a pilot today, I think we would all be challenged to be flying that type of aircraft today. Yeah. Uh, so really thinking about the skill that it took to fly an aircraft like that back in the 1920s is significant. Yeah. Uh, and the fact that Bessie Coleman was able to do that and do it well and do it for a number of years is, is really amazing. And, yeah. You know, like, like I said, she joins the number of American women on the quarters program including Eleanor Roosevelt and several others uh, that are significant in our own history. Yeah, definitely an inspiration. That's yeah, very cool. Very, yeah. And the doll is, it's, it's really neat. It's uh, well one. done. We showed it. Yeah. On YouTube. So definitely uh, something to look for, for your, maybe your daughter or niece or granddaughter or whatever. Uh, very cool. All right, David. So moving on to Garmin, the GFC 500 uh, autopilot that's had some runaway trim issues. They, sure. uh, yep. They issued a service bulletin for that. We didn't really talk about it on the show much. Um, but there is a fix now in it's been FAA approved. And so before where you had to like placard this thing and I think potentially take it out and pull the circuit breaker and everything else, it's like, okay, now you got the software fix and it, and it hopefully will resolve the issues. Yeah. So the good news on this, uh, it's a good news, bad news situation. I want to say the good news is that number one, uh, the modification may be reimbursed under warranty, but hmm, the bad maybe. news is that there's a dead. Well, yeah, maybe I yeah. would say most likely because they're all yeah, pretty new. They're all pretty yeah. new. The deadline is June 30th. So do not, folks who are Garmin uh, GFC 500 owners, uh, do not let the grass grow under your feet. Go ahead and get that taken care of. And I would say that is good news. You know, it was a runaway trim issue, Ian. Somewhat similar, I'm thinking, to the Boeing 737 MAX issue where you had yeah. a nose up, an uncommanded nose up uh, incident. And in our case at AOPA, we have a, um, a, a Cessna 182 with that particular uh, autopilot and a 172 mm -hmm. that we had to pull the uh, circuit breakers, as you said, placard the airplane. The flight ops folks put a note out to everyone not to use the autopilot. And, it, and, and really, it took a lot of the utility out of that instrument yeah. platform. While yeah. That, while that's occurring. Absolutely. I mean, there's are not inexpensive units. And so they're put in airplanes that are meant to go places right. in all kinds of weather. And so, yeah, it absolutely does take out utility. Um, I think there's a couple of things about this that just, you know, even if you don't have the GFC 500, we should be thinking about one is if you fly with an autopilot is getting training for one runaway trim. Yeah. Uh, it's really point. important. I mean, this is the thing I think where you need some refresher training as well. I mean, just the one time checkout is not going to do it. You should be hitting this at least yearly. And that's how do you disconnect the autopilot, you know, working with those in increased control pressures, that sort of thing. 
Yeah, I agree with you 100%. And um, the first thing that comes to my mind is that, uh, at least on the 182, there's a red kill switch uh, right on the yoke. That's the first thing I would do, and which I have done, actually, in that aircraft. Because, you know, when I fumbled around with getting the autopilot working, if I wasn't exactly sure what was going on, yeah. it's really easy to turn off that way. But you know what? Identify that circuit breaker. And a lot of times, it's not a bad idea to go ahead and, and put a different colored collar around that mm -hmm, circuit breaker on. anyway. Yeah. Yep. So you know how to get to it and then and sort of recognize that maybe close your eyes and reach for where that circuit breaker is in. That's that good, would help because yeah. yeah. you can always, you know, do manual trim. You don't need electric trim. You really don't need autopilot if you're trimmed correctly. Mm -hmm. You know, if you're just doing, you know, uh, flights that are not as demanding as, say, an instrument approach. Yeah. So, yeah, it, but true. it's super handy when you're flying an instrument approach uh, to have that autopilot help fly it for you. Yeah. Yeah, it's interesting. And it's funny, I was just reading about this, actually. And this is kind of a separate issue. But um, these some of these newer digital autopilots and having some trouble with um, some software issues, some of them servo issues. I was just reading the Cessna Owner magazine had a story about this. Some of the um, non TSO stuff or less inexpensive, we'll call them digital autopilots. Uh -huh. Sure. Um, and they the writer had surveyed a few shops and they had talked about some of these some servo issues with these. And so I think this particular thing might be a software problem. It was um, indeed. Yeah. It was. Yes. Yeah. But um, th that's, you know, definitely some growing pains with, with some of these units, I think. Yeah. And before we leave the subject, I want to let our listeners and surprise you at the same time with some new information about that Garmin 500 autopilot. I just got back from a, a story at American champion aircraft over near Milwaukee mm -hmm. at Walker River airport. And they have a scout model that was just certified to have that Garmin autopilot installed. Oh, cool. So the very first American champion aircraft uh, with a Garmin 500 autopilot is, is being installed in that aircraft right now. Numero uno hmm. It's destined for the Idaho backcountry, wow. And uh, so that's a little bit of spot news for you. And, and for our listeners and viewers, uh, be, you know, go ahead and stay tuned for a, a future story on American champion aircraft. Nice. Okay. Uh, FBO fees, David. So we haven't talked about these in a couple of months, I think. Uh -huh. um, trying to hit this from all angles. Hopefully you know this issue by now. This is where FBOs are either charging exorbitant fees or some kind of shadow pricing. It's like they say, oh, it's a $20 ramp fee. You get there and then it's 150 bucks for whatever. Um, we still are getting reports at AOPA about excessive fees. I've read a couple just recently about like Key West, for example. Um, other places will have event fees that are really outrageous. So we have tried many different avenues to both get the fees reasonable and then transparent. One of those new ones that we're going after is actually the Federal Trade Commission. Another regulatory, you know, uh, yes. arm. There. Yeah, because, of course, the FAA likes to kind of hold up their hands a little bit and say, oh, well, we don't deal with pricing we so much. Deal with this. Yeah, yeah. Sure. But the FTC, which we always joke about, it's like truth in advertising, right? So, you know, you have to be somewhat honest. Yeah. Um, and so they've put out an NPRM that talks about some of this, some of these, they call this, in fact, drip pricing. And that is to me, exactly what happens in an FBO where you're, you walk in and you think it's going to be one price. And then they just keep layering on these fees. And it's a totally different price when you walk out the door. Kind of like when you're buying a car sometimes yeah. the end, and then yeah. you get the floor mats and the protection package that you didn't really want. Didn't want yeah, yeah, or, or need. need. Yeah. But yeah, so the FA, uh, the FTC has the authority to review these fees under Section 5A1 of the Federal Trade Commission Act, which prohibits, and this is, I think, the key phrase, quote, unfair or deceptive acts or practices, unquote. Mm -hmm. So that is the key. So the FTC can investigate this and take a look, uh, see what's going on behind the scenes, try to get a little bit more transparency there. But I do want to give credit where credit is due. We've come a long way so far. Yeah, we're we're not absolutely. quite across the finish line altogether, but yes, but yet another way to get closer to that finish line. Yeah, that's right. So this NPRM deals with some of these issues um, and asks the uh, FTC to look into it. And so AOPA has put comments forth on that NPRM talking about the FBO pricing yep. and and pushing for more transparency for consumers and and more holistic pricing. So for example, you know, you're just talking about like the rust packages for cars. They're notorious for that. Um, this NPRM talks about actually something that we all used to deal with, which was you remember airline tickets. They used to be, you know, oh, yeah. you get this big time sale price at the front and then all the taxes would come on the end and all the charges and everything else. 
So um, that's now no longer happening because of some additional rules. And so they're looking for more instances like that. And, and we think FBOs are one of those. Ian, you explained it really well and very concisely. Thank you for that, that <laughs> bit of uh, no. extra effort. But that makes perfect sense. You're right. Is that, you know, you can compare it to an airline ticket that was advertised for $49. And by the time you were done paying for it, it was $99. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yep. All right. So moving on. Last thing moving we want to on. talk about. Yes. Let's move, move on and move up. Yeah. Hydrogen power. Uh, one of the cool alternative fuel, sort of future power, future fuels that are out there. We've talked about eVTOL and others. SAF. Um, now we're talking about hydrogen and specifically Zero Avia. And they just did a, a test flight, well, a flight in their test process that was pretty impressive. They, they flew a 19 seat aircraft. Yeah, the 19 seat Dornier 228. One engine was uh, the typical Honeywell TPE 311. Uh, I'm sorry, TPE 331 is a stock engine. However, the other was a prototype hydrogen electric powertrain. And that's where the big news is. It powered uh, the aircraft. They went on about a, what, a 10 minute flight in. They did mm -hmm. a couple of circuits yep. around the pattern there. And yep. uh, this was overseas, by the way. It was in England, if I'm not uh, mistaken. Right. And because uh, they, right. the company said they were going to go before the end of last year. They, they, they said they would do some, some cool stuff in January. And they did. Right. Mm -hmm. so, yep. They did. They flew. Okay. So we're showing that now. Um, yeah. Like you said, normal engine, hydrogen engine. Um, I'm not going to get into the specifics of how this works because to be completely honest, I don't know. Yeah. Um, I don't know if any <laughs> of us know, except for maybe the engineers. Um, it's essentially hydrogen hybrid technology. It's, yeah. a, it's hydrogen power that runs, you know, batteries that runs the electric engine. Um, this 228, I don't, I don't really know the 228. This is a cool air looking airplane. It's a little bit like the, well, the same class as the beach 1900, I suppose, 19 yeah. seats, but yeah. So it's a high wing, uh, twin turbo yeah. typically, yeah. Uh, for a prop aircraft and it's a people mover i mean it's a mm -hmm. it's a, it's a it's regional a people mover regional yep. airliner yep. someone who might go you know sometimes you're going to go say snow ski and you go to a major hub and this will get you to the outlying smaller airport uh mm -hmm. like aspen or something like that yeah uh, so yeah that that's pretty interesting the um the other company that's kind of in sort of a similar race ian if i could bring it up is a uh, universal hydrogen Mm -hmm. And um, they've got a, a major investment from American Airlines and had big plans uh, and still have big plans to convert the Dash 8 to Havilands uh, in, in 2023. So we're now in 2023. Mm -hmm. And so we could look to the future and the near future for those de Havilland Dash 8 300 models to start using a little bit of hydrogen for their flight, too. Yeah. So I anticipate some more news on that front. Yeah, this is cool stuff. I mean, so we talked about this, I think, a long time ago when we first talked about hydrogen power and zero avia. But the the idea is that infrastructure would be set up at at sort of uh, all the regional airports that it serves. Um, I know zero avia's business model was kind of a power by the hour thing. So they would take care of the whole infrastructure and everything else and maintenance and the airline would just lease the airplane at a per hour rate and then go from there. Um, interesting business model. And, and it's cool. Cause, and I mean, I think all of this stuff is it mixes together in this big melting pot. It's like, it's all progress, right? Um, yeah. so well, you know, I, I agree with you. I think that, um, the main thing, uh, as you said, and we've talked about this before is the infrastructure and getting all of the little pieces in place. It's like a big puzzle trying to put it mm -hmm. all together. And uh, we've heard the, the same kind of comments from folks, with uh, the replacement to, um, you know, 100, you know, unleaded, the G100UL yeah. that that George Brawley is uh, bringing to market. The same thing is that, you know, hey, we got to get the infrastructure together. The product is there. We just need to figure out how to get it into the end user's hands. Yeah, so exactly. I, but I like that hybrid technology. I, you know, you are a former Prius owner mm -hmm. and I yep. am too, Toyota yeah. Prius. And I think that that hybrid technology is probably the way things are going to shake out. Now. Probably. Yeah. 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 I, that was, I mean, that's the best car we have, we've ever owned. I mean, the, the complexity of that technology and how well it ran and how reliable it was, it's just incredible. I yeah. So with that, uh, yeah. seeing some reliability like that with aviation, saving a few bucks, that's all well and good. Maybe, maybe yeah. we can get more people involved if uh, the cost of entry is a little bit lower. Yeah. And another thing about this, and this is a great segue is that the, 
as you get more modern technology, it gets more exciting to be in the, in the industry. Yeah. Right? Um, yeah. So you get more sophisticated panels, you get more young kids interested in software engineering and working those things. And the same thing, I think for the main maintenance side, hence people like Chelsea Smith, who are going to hopefully take us into that future and work on things like hydrogen and eVTOLs and everything else. I am Chelsea Smith from Louisville, Kentucky, and I am on a long trip with Josh Flowers. We're filming a series for Aviation 101, which took us from San Marcos, Texas to Louisville, Kentucky, where I'm from, and then up to Oshkosh, and then into Canada, down the East Coast, ending the trip in the Bahamas. So it's three countries in three weeks. Are you his co-pilot or are you his maintenance officer, or are you both? I am his pilot, his co-pilot, and his maintenance officer. What is your uh, background? My background, so I started flying when I was 17 and went all the way to my solo cross countries. And then it was my senior year was coming up and my mom was like, I was in Tennessee doing my training and my mom was like, get home, senior year starts next week. So I didn't end up finishing my private pilot. I was there doing that with my uncle, which is the person that got me into aviation. So I went home thinking, you know, I would never be able to finish. And I graduated high school and then started flight training again immediately after. And I had three flight schools close. And I was feeling like I was just hitting roadblock after roadblock after roadblock. And within that time frame, I was signing up for college. And that's when the advisor, and I was just signing up for basic classes, my gen eds. And that's when the advisor told me to declare my major and handed me a sheet and aviation maintenance technology was at the top. It was a career field I had never considered or thought of, but I was like, absolutely, why not? I want to be in aviation and I really didn't have a roadmap on how to get there, but I figured it would put me closer. And looking back, I think that the maintenance route, which was the best thing I ever accidentally walked into, has been my biggest love and asset in aviation. Are you a tinkerer and a maker and a do-it-yourselfer? Why would, um, I think if most females are not generally considered, sadly, that yeah. we are going to be the, the getting their fingernails dirty and yeah. getting the engine. Why, why did you think that would be you? So probably two things. I, I credit my um, love and beginning aviation to my uncle. He is the one that got me into it, but I accredit being brave enough to say yes to the program to my parents. My dad worked on absolutely everything in our driveway from his heavy equipment, bulldozers, and he had a welding company and did, he did everything. So growing up in his shadow, watching him do all of that made me think anything could be fixed. And then I think someone that is usually not mentioned, I just did a big talk in, um, at Oshkosh and everybody said I got into aviation because my dad and my uncle. And I think that that is typically the story, but I wouldn't have said yes to a maintenance program when the counselor looked across the table three times and said, are you sure it says maintenance? I think I wouldn't have said yes to that question with an absolute yes, I'm sure, if it wasn't for my mom. Um, she's always made me very brave and what do you like best about it? Maintenance. So for me, maintenance was this daunting thing. Looking at, I walked into the aviation maintenance program with absolutely no background. I had never worked on an aircraft before. I had done some flight lessons, so I knew a little bit about fundamentals and control surfaces and systems, but only enough to get me through, you know, solo and everything. So I really didn't know anything that was going on in firewall forward. And I had only seen the cowling off one time when I was cutting through the maintenance hangar. So when I say I walked into the class knowing absolutely nothing, that's true. So it went from being this huge complicated system to breaking everything down to its simplest level. One of, at least, one of five basic um, me mechanical properties. So a screw, a lever, a wedge, and, and so on. And so once I started to see everything taken apart totally and put back together and fixed, it was incredibly rewarding and I was instantly hooked. Um, what do you provide for, um, for this, this long cross country? Do you, 
what do you think your best contribution is it is it taking care of the airplane or is it um, being a co-pilot um well we alternate pilot so some legs he flies PIC and then others I'm PIC um, when it comes to maintenance I think that the plane is so well maintained that you don't usually run into maintenance issues on the road um, all of the oil change and everything was taken care of before we left on this trip so there's not a lot of maintenance that we're doing on the road but if anything breaks the troubleshooting process in the air is something that I can bring to the table on a different level and that every mechanic can. And that's one of the main reasons I encourage all pilots to get involved with maintenance. Um, I should know this and I don't. Um, do you have your own social media that you talk maintenance? I do, yes. So Tell me what it is. All I have right now is an Instagram and it is high maintenance underscore chels. So high maintenance chels, kind of a spin because I'm very girly. Um, and then also doing, I do oil change information, spark plug, and continuing to do a lot more. Do you work for a specific company or are you a freelance I don't, I do all freelance stuff. I just wrapped up a stint in Kingman, Arizona where I specialize on radial engine overhaul process. I've done advanced composite training. I just got selected to do the Pratt & Whitney uh, PT6 engine course. So I have bounced around all over the place and anyone who is involved with GA maintenance knows that one day you might be changing a tire and then the next day you're doing sheet metal. So when you do GA stuff, you are truly, you have to know the full ship. Huh, wow, wow. I know nothing about maintenance. So um, as we discussed about my car, all this thing is so totally foreign to me. So it's, so it's when you said you were girly, do you, is it just that you enjoy, I'm trying to, trying to get a handle on, on um, what you like about it. Yeah, um, so I think you can be super girly and still find it so rewarding to pull the cowling off and troubleshoot something, get it fixed, get the cowling back on. To me, I don't think that those two things are put together very often and usually seen together, um, but I, I absolutely fit that bill and find it very rewarding. Even are you though. taken seriously most places you go to? Um, so that's yes and no. Um, I think I am taken seriously whenever I'm actually working on a shop floor. All of the guys I've ever worked with, I've only ever worked with one other female mechanic in my entire life. Um, and I even remember what it was like a year and a half into a maintenance program and meeting another female mechanic for the first time. I had no girls in my class when I graduated. Um, so when I'm on the shop floor with the guys, I think, you know, I can't take it personally that they don't take me seriously at the beginning because they're not gonna take anyone seriously. It doesn't matter who walks through the door with their toolbox on day one, it's, they're gonna be apprehensive. So I, I get that. And I find that once I start doing the work alongside them and working next to them, that all of the studying and all of the extra stuff that I've done to prepare for those jobs pays off and it shines through and I'm treated very well. Where I feel like I am not taken seriously um, kind of comes into play with people in the pilot sector. They seem to be more doubtful and kind of puff their chest on asking hard maintenance questions to see if they can stump you and they're trying to quiz you. But my attitude about it is to, like I said, not take any of that personally because they will probably do that to the next guy that walks in that l looks like a mechanic too. So. so we talked with Josh about the growing the pilot population. On that same level, how would you, what do you think we should do or can do to grow the female pilot population or not even female, it's just, you know, other than the 97% male, what's, what, what do we need to do to, to move that needle? I think, so to revert back to the maintenance side a little bit, um, and it was a conversation that we just had in the other hangar we're talking about this pilot program that's being integrated into the high schools and they do include some maintenance stuff, but it's not included enough. And I, I see it in every space I am that the maintenance side is not shown off the same. It's not put out there the same. The programs are not um, 
seen to be as accessible in a lot of ways. And whenever we went around the classroom, whenever I started the aviation maintenance program, almost every person in the class said, I would have signed up for this years ago if I knew it existed. Mm -hmm. And so to grow the pilot population and the maintenance population, I think keep doing what you guys are doing here at AOPA, building the curriculum, building the programs, integrating it, making people feel welcome, making them know that, or letting them know that this is something attainable. And then after you inspire them, giving them the roadmap. So not only what you can do with this, but how you do it. And I think that that is starting to be implemented in high schools across the country. Ian, that was a great interview. And thanks to Julie Walker for pulling that off. And it just goes to show you how important it is that behind every pilot is a great maintenance technician. Yeah, that's absolutely right, David. And um, worth their weight in gold, certainly. So really glad to have that. Hey, I think that's all the time we have for this week. I'm Ian Twombly. Our editor is Austin Hansen. I'm David Toulis. Don't forget, you can find us at aopa.org slash hangertalk, wherever you get your podcasts and on YouTube. All right. See you next time. See you, Ian.